way when I was uh, Secretary of State for Energy uh, 30 years ago, I listened very carefully to the best scientific advice I could get. But at the end of the day, the responsibility for formulating policy was mine, and I accepted that responsibility. Why did Cancun and, and uh, Copenhagen fail? Uh, they failed largely because uh, neither China nor India, the two countries who are making the, uh, like make the biggest, China already is, and India will, the biggest contribution to the increase in carbon dioxide emissions, which is expected in the next 50 or 100 years, they were not prepared to pay ball. And they were not prepared to pay ball, they were quite right, quite right. The priority for these countries, and indeed for many other countries, but let's focus on these two. The priority for these countries is the fastest possible rate of economic development. They have hundreds of millions of their people in the direst poverty. In India, something like 40% of homes still have no electricity. They want to develop as fast as they possibly can to get to these people out of poverty and out of the consequences of poverty in terms of malnutrition, uh, preventable disease uh, and premature death. And that means, among other things, not solely, it means pursuing the right economic policies, of course, but it also means taking advantage of the cheapest form of energy and that is now and will be for the foreseeable future carbon based energy. So they're not going to give it up. Whatever they may say, they're not going to, and they're quite right. Indeed, for anybody in the West to tell them they must go from relatively cheap energy to more expensive energy and therefore increase the amount of uh, poverty, disease, malnutrition and preventable death, I think is most profoundly immoral. I think this is a moral issue and the present policy is a profoundly immoral one. The, but fortunately, they are not going to adopt it. So where does that leave us in this country and in the other countries in the West? But I care particularly, obviously, about this country. Well, of course, uh, the government of the day, the politicians, realize that it's going to be it's increasingly difficult to sell decarbonization on global warming grounds. So they're trying now to sell it on other grounds. They say, well, there's, you know, we're going to run out of, of carbon uh, fuels, so we've got to cut back. I remember, as I say, when I became Energy Secretary in 1981, the first thing I did was to got, get the bosses of the, of the two major British-based oil companies uh, to my office, and I said, tell me, tell me what I ought to know. And they said, well, I'll tell you, Secretary of State, that there is only 40 years of oil, extractable oil, left in the world. That was 30 years ago. What do they say now? They say there's only 40 years. They always say there's only 40 years. They say, uh, in fact, so far from running out of carbon, we are, have never been so flush uh, because technology has improved the possibility of commercial extraction of oil and in particular of gas with the development of shale gas and the new technology of uh, uh, horizontal drilling and fracturing, the, the ability now to produce shale gas competitively and cheaply uh, it has transformed the energy position. There has never been such an abundance of carbon energy as there is now. So that doesn't run. Then they talk about energy security. Well, we've got energy security. We can't rely on Mr. Putin and this unstable Middle East. Well, again, the shale gas is all over the world. In nice places like uh, North America, South America, Poland, you name it. So we've never had less of a worry about energy security. Never. So there's no reason on that one. And then there's a further, the final lamentable reason they give. Oh, well, nevertheless, this will be a wonderful, um, wonderful way of creating new jobs, green jobs, if we go switch over to renewables. This is economic illiteracy of the worst order. Uh, um, the... The president mentioned Frederick Bastiat. One of the, Frederick Bastiat in the late 19th century, uh, one of the few really good French economists, uh, there, haven't been, there haven't been many since then, uh, the, he uh, said, look, you might as well say you should go around breaking windows in order to create jobs for glaziers. Uh, and of course, as Adam Smith pointed out, uh, creation of employment 
uh, is not the object of economic effort. Indeed, insofar as employment has anything to do with it, the object of economic effort is to increase productivity, which means reducing jobs, so that the people can be employed meeting other needs, which is what will happen, that... Um, that the people require. So it is, it, it is a new form of Luddism, really, but that's exactly what the Luddites did. They went away around uh, smashing machinery to preserve jobs, and the green jobs argument is really, in, in economic and intellectual terms, no different from that. So that's where we are. The global agreement is not going to happen. We shouldn't waste our time. What do we do? We will do what mankind has always done and always will do. We will adapt to whatever the circumstances are, whatever the temperatures are, whatever the, the happens in rainfall, whatever happens in other ways, we will adapt. And we have never been better able to adapt. We have never had greater technological ability to adapt than we have today, and we've not adapted too badly in the past. The only problem is this country. This country has passed the Climate Change Act which, unlike any other country in the world, makes it legally binding on us to decarbonize pretty well completely the UK economy uh, by uh, 2050. Uh, it is absolute madness, because obviously if we do it, with, we're responsible for 2% of global emissions, if we do it when China and India are not doing it, America's not going to do it either. Take my word for it, but you know that America's not going to do it either. So now the three biggest countries uh, in the world are not going to do it, and uh, so our 2% is neither here nor there, so there's absolutely no point at all. But not only, uh, not only is there uh, no point in it, it would be very damaging. Well, what does the British government say? And the same previous government said they, the British government said, we are, this is a lead we are giving to the world. We are the only country in the world which has this legally binding commitment. Yes, indeed we are, because no other country is so stupid. Uh, and this is something which the British government should be ashamed of. Uh, that is, we're the only country in the world that has this ridiculous uh, and damaging agreement. So I, I would like to do my conclusion to help the government, uh, which is what I always have wanted to do. And I think that they should not abandon it. They should stick with it as their policy, but they should say it should go into suspense until such time as there is a global agreement. Because there ain't going to be no global agreement. Thank you.